That made me stop in my tracks. I loved going to work more than I loved coming to church. And I said to myself, that can't be. That's not how it's supposed to be. And I asked myself the question, why? Well, here's the thing. As I said to you, when I went to work, I felt this joy, this bond, and this relationship with my fellow work colleagues. But I remember when I was going to, going to church and growing up, as soon as I stepped through the doors, get me. <clears throat> Why are you not dressed like that? I can't believe that this is happening. And, and, and then you would hear brother and sister so and so talking in the background, criticizing. It seemed that every time I came to church, the only thing I was ever met with was a negative vibe. There was always something wrong with something. And that put a barrier between me and building a relationship. Always an issue. When I went to work, and I went out with my friends and my colleagues, they would say, no, Max, no, don't get that. That has alcohol in it. Can you believe that? They were helping me on my Christian walk. But when I come to church, when I come to church, it's a different case. The epiphany moment I had was that there's a strong indictment when the world acts more Christian than Christians in the church. That's a massive indictment. And it's a massive message for me. And here's the interesting thing. I want us to look at the story of Jonah because I find the story of Jonah very, very interesting. Jonah chapter 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amati, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. So God has given Jonah a command. He's telling Jonah, listen, you need to go, not tomorrow, not, not next week, but go at once to Nineveh, because their wickedness has come up before me. But what does the good prophet do? The, the, the good church going Jonah do? He runs in the other direction. Now it's very interesting at this point, if, if we weren't to look forward in the story, we have no idea why Jonah's running. It could be anything. It could be he's scared for his life. It could be that he, he just doesn't want to go. We just don't know. But what we do know is that he goes in the opposite direction. The prophet of God doesn't do the job he was ordained to do. He goes and he does something else. Okay, that's fair enough. But the Bible makes a, a, a bit of point about this. If, if you understand how, how Hebrew literature works, you would see that they try to emphasize this a little bit more. If you read carefully the next couple of verses, he says that Jonah goes to Tarshish. And when he gets on the boat, he goes down to the bottom of the boat. And then as he goes down to the bottom of the boat, he lies down to sleep. He uses the word going down quite repetitively. And what the author is trying to say here is, Jonah's not just running away from God, he's running away from God. As far as, as he can go, as deep as he can go, trying to get away from what God has called him to do. But that, that's fair enough. But here's what happens in verse 4. God hurled a great wind upon the sea, such a mighty storm came upon them that the, the, the sea, that the ship was threatened to break up. Now here's where it doesn't get okay for me. Verse 5. Verse 5 says that when this happened, what did they do? They prayed to their gods. Okay, so maybe it's not the God of Yahweh. 
And so, so the, you know, okay, maybe they're being a bit, bit foolish, but contrast that with what happens a little later on. Where is Jonah? While the, the, the people, the, the heathens are praying to their gods to be saved, Jonah's asleep. Jonah is asleep at the bottom of the boat. It's a strong indictment on Jonah when the heathens are doing what he should do. And the thing is, they know no better. They're praying to their gods. But Jonah is a servant of the God of Israel. If he was to pray, something would happen. But where is Jonah? He's at the bottom of the boat at sea. So I, I'm a bit uncomfortable now. Because Jonah's not doing, or well not living up really to what he should be doing. But it seems that the heathens on the boat are. But it gets me a bit even more uncomfortable because here's, here's what happens. They then go to find Jonah. And what do they say to him? Get up. Don't you care? Why don't you pray to your God? Now if it's not bad enough that the, the heathens are doing what Jonah should be doing, it's even worse that they're telling him that he should be praying. It's a strong indictment when the people of the world act more Christian than the Christians of the church themselves. Jonah should have been the one leading the forefront of this. But yet he was running away from God. And the Bible is, is telling us, showing us very clearly what should, what should have been happening, but it wasn't. The heathens were doing what Jonah should be doing. But here's the thing, if that wasn't enough to get me unsettled, it gets even worse for me. For me, when I'm reading it, it gets me even more unsettled. Because what happens next is that they then cast lots and they say, right, okay, well, we're going to pray and we're going to see who's the cause of this problem. And they find out that Jonah is the problem. <coughs> and Jonah tells them what they need to do in order for all of this to stop. They say, Jonah says, throw me off the boat. <coughs> now, if I'm a Christian and I'm trying to predict what the heathens would do, my predictions would be, yeah, okay, we'll see you later, Jonah. Throw you straight off. I'm going to save myself. But what do they do? The Bible says they roll even harder. Because throwing Jonah off isn't something that they want to do. They don't want to be responsible for taking another man's life. But it goes even more than that. When they finally realize that they have to do what God has commanded, they pray to God. And the, the Hebrew says they pray to Yahweh, not their own gods. They pray to Yahweh and they say, Lord, let this not be charged against us. We do not want this man to die. If ever someone was acting Christian, it certainly wasn't Jonah, but it certainly was the heathen people. And Jonah then finds himself out of the boat and in the belly of a whale, or so the story goes. We just know it's a big fish of the Bible. And then we see. Or we, we should see Jonah's prayer. When I first read this, it seems to me that this is Jonah's conversion story. Jonah prays and he lets, he lets God know how he has been saved and he has been delivered. But when I read it, some, some of the things do, don't match up with how Jonah's been behaving. If I go into verse 2, Right at the end, he says, in verse 8, For those who worship vain idols 
forsake their loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. You see, what he's saying here is very standard in, in terms of, like, if you read some of the Psalms or any sort of other poetry, you know, the gods of the, the, the people of the world, they, 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 they do foolishness. They forsake you and they do foolishness. But I, who am I'm a servant of God, I, I, I do what's right and I give thanks and... Well, hang on a second. Everything that's happened so far seems to suggest quite the opposite. And it would, it would seem to be okay, but everything that happens later on doesn't change much at all. To me, there are two things are that, that are happening here. Either one, one, Jonah has what I call a kind of a conversion, but it's a superficial one. He's taking God for granted. So he knows that God has saved him, but he expects to be saved because he is the God of the, the, the Hebrews. He, he expects that. So it's kind of a superficial, it's, it's, not, it's not really taking root. We, we talked a little bit in, in the class about the, the seed sown um, by the, the, the great soul of Jesus. And some, some fall on shallow ground and they, they spring up quickly, but when times of trouble come, they, they get ripped up. It's that kind of thing. It's take root, but it's not strong roots. Or, or secondly, it could be that Jonah is just going through the motions. He's a good, God-fearing person, and so he writes what he's expected to write. If you look at that, that psalm, it's like any other psalm. It's perfect. It's what is expected to, to be written. He goes through the motions. But either way, something is going on here with Jonah that shouldn't be happening. Anyhow, God spits him out onto the land and the story continues. And he tells Jonah that you need to go to Nineveh again. This time, Jonah goes. This time, he says the message. Now, here's the interesting thing. They respond to the message. But more than them responding to the message, the king, the leader of the Ninevites, remember these were the wicked people. They go around um, torturing other nations, ransacking, taking over, doing barbaric, bar barbaric things. The king stands up and he proclaims to all of Nineveh, we are going to all have a day of prayer and warning, and hopefully God will let us live. Now this is why I feel a bit unsettled that Jonah's conversion isn't really fully there. Because at this great sight, what does the good prophet do? Is he happy and rejoicing when God saves the people of Nineveh? He is angry. He is upset. And now, and only now, is it revealed why Jonah fled in the first place. He said, I knew, this is why I fled. This is chapter 4 now. This is why I fled, because I knew you're a merciful God, and that if I went there, they would repent, and you would not do what you said you were going to do. Wow. Now, in some ways, I understand, Joel, because these are wicked people. So, so it's hard to, 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 to see that. It's like, it's like, if I want to put it this way, the whole nation of IS, that, that whole state, turned around and said, we're going to repent. And God, God forgives them, and no judgment is brought upon them. I can understand why they will be angry. Because the barbaric things that they've done, throwing people off buildings, executing, that's horrific. I, I, I can get that. I can understand the, 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 the anger and the frustration. 
Quantos? Quantos, quantos, quantos? Jonah. Jonah takes this to a level which just hasn't been seen before. You see, for Jonah, he already had in his mind what these people were like. He had in his mind what these people deserved. And there was nothing that they could have done that could have ever changed his mind about that. You could have, you could have, he could have taken blood, a pound of flesh, whatever it was, it wouldn't have changed his mind. If they were to come into the courts of Jonah, he would have found them guilty no matter what. And so Jonah is upset. And he's upset to the point where he's saying to God, God, just, just, just kill me. Kill me now, because I can't bear to live. If this is how my life is going to be, if this is what you're going to do, then kill me now. You see, this is where Jonah becomes this, this kind of a, a grouchy old man, if I want to put it that way. He becomes a, a, a person that's just surrounded in negativity because he's forgotten the God that he serves, what it actually means to be a servant of the God of Israel, the God of Isaac, Jacob, and, uh, and uh, Abraham, said it the wrong way. But he, he forgot what it meant to be that. He forgot the reason why God was acting and moving in the ways that he was, he was moving. And so Jonah becomes one of those people that are just not happy. Nineveh, no matter what you do, it's not, no, I, I, I'm not accepting it. So he sits there, and for want of a better word, he's sulking. He sits there on a the mountain, and he's sulking. And so what does God do? He provides a tree to come up and shake him. But then he sends the worm to come and eat the tree, and takes it down so that the shade is gone. And what does that do? He gets even more upset. This is where Jonah reminds me of one of those, those, those people, everything's going wrong, everything is a problem, everything is an issue. Oh, this is, you know, you, God, you didn't destroy the Ninevites, you bring this tree, now you're taking it away, you give it to a worm, now the breather, I'm getting too much of a sudden, Lord, everything's going wrong, and what does he say in the Bible? Kill me now, Lord. Kill me now. You see, if I was looking on the outside, who would I rather want to be in community with? Jonah? Or the people in the heathen? They seemed to know what it was to understand the character of God better than the man of God himself. The man who was meant to speak for and on behalf of God. And there he was, and God speaks to him, and he says to him, Why are you upset, Jonah? Why are you upset? Should you be concerned about this bush? Are you concerned about this bush? And he answers very aggressively, very angry. He says, yes. So much so, that you should just kill me now. You should just kill me now, because my life is not worth living. Like that. Now I'm putting it like this because this is how the, the Bible wants to put it. It's kind of like an a, a over dramatic, um, he's been a bit of a drama queen. He's been a bit, bit, bit over dramatic about this. He's making a mountain out of a molehill and he's creating issues where there aren't issues. And God says, God says to him, you're concerned about the bush. You're, you're upset because I took the bush away. And then, then this is how God speaks. You didn't plant the bush. It came one day and it was gone the, the, the next day. You didn't do anything for it. You had no... It was me who provided it for you. So why are you upset? Why are you upset? The interesting thing is, is that maybe that worm needed to eat as well. 
Maybe, maybe they're well needed to eat. And here, here, is, here is the point, though, because God says, should I not be concerned about Nineveh? 120,000 people who do not know their right from their left and their cattle too. Now, now, that, that, that seems like an interesting question, but here is where I think the story of Jonah is most powerful. That's where it ends. You read the very last verse of the very last book of the book of Jonah, it ends asking a question. Should I not be concerned with the people of Nineveh? Why does it do that? Well, it's written down to ask a question not just to Jonah, but to the person who reads the book of Jonah. You see, the story is not so much about God's grace to, to, to the Ninevites as much as that is part of it. The story is more about Jonah. And the story is more about the people who read the book of Jonah. You see, it's a very, very strong indictment when the people of the world act more Christian than the Christians of the church. Jonah was a man of God. And he thought that he knew better than God. So in his mind, everything that he was thinking was right and justified. He thought that if things went his way, it would be better for the world, better for the church, better for Israel, better for everyone. But what he forgot was the one thing. God cares about everybody. And so God asked Jonah the question, should I not be concerned? about the people of Nineveh. And should I not be concerned, here you are, Jonah, sitting down here, just talking and criticizing, and, and all I hear from you is negativity, but I hear not one ounce of praise that 100,000 people have been saved. That you have been part of a movement that has added people to the kingdom. But you're sitting there, criticizing, and you're, you're thinking that life is so bad, Kill me now. Should you be concerned about the bush? Should I, as God, not be concerned about him? So here's the point. Just as God asked that question to Jonah, that question was intended for the readers of the Bible back in that day, but it's also intended for us here today in 2016. Should we not be concerned for the people of Battersea? Should we not be concerned for the people of London? When people walk through these doors and they come and they sit down in these chairs and pews, do they think it's a joy to sit down here? Or are we just a bunch of Jonas? Do they think it a joy to be out in the world? One thing that I didn't tell you was that my work colleagues were filled with people who had drug problems, they were the homosexual, they, they, they didn't, they smoked, they drank. We were, we were the people who obtain and, and we, 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 we uphold a high morality. But if, 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 if someone comes here and feels it more comfortable to feel friendship amongst people of the world, then there's a problem here. Are we like Jonah here today? Or are we like the heathens of the book of Jonah? Do we understand what it means to be a Christian? Do we understand what it means to understand the character of God? What does that mean? Jonah, as I said, this book was for Jonah. He needed to be reminded what the character of God meant. It meant that God is concerned for all people. And if it means that people will be saved, that's what God's mission is. And so that's the question I leave here today. Are we concerned, or should we be concerned, for the people around us?